We all have a comeback story, don't we? Everybody likes an underdog story where we come back or we see someone that comes back from a, a position of like being low or down and just like so. Every good sermon should start off with a story about football, right? <laughs> I don't know if we've got any real football fans in the house. Yeah, if you're a Manchester United fan, I'm sorry. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe this is the, the message that, that Ten Hag needs to hear to like bring them back from the from the brink. But uh, I, I'm a I'm a well, I'm a West Ham fan first and foremost. But actually. <laughs> Hold on a minute, hecklers in the crowd. But, but actually, I'm becoming more of a Bishop Stortford fan. Over the last few seasons, I've been taking my kids to go and see Bishop Stortford play. They're of a reasonable level, you know, they're in the Isthmian League. You know, actually, as for the level that they play, they're, they're one of the better teams. And so we're hoping for good things this season. They almost won promotion last year, narrowly missed out. But um, my daughter... And she's been to six games last season and she saw 27 goals, which is amazing, right? And so we thought, well, we'll go to the football. Opening day of the league yesterday, so a few of us went down there to go and watch the mighty Stortford play Haringey Borough. Noella with us, though. And a goal went in. It went in at the wrong end. Well, this wasn't a moment, was it? I could have got on the phone to my wife, I could have just said, bring Ella down with you, we need her, we need her. But unfortunately, she wasn't available, she had other commitments, like getting her eyes sorted out. But with all that said, Stalford showed great character and came back from the goal down to win the game 2-1. Now, it takes, and we all recognise the character required in order to come back from a position like that, especially... Do you know what? It was not a cool day yesterday, was it? It was not a day that we'd like to be running around the field, particularly chasing a ball around, you know. So, fair play to them. But they made a real comeback. And so many of us find ourselves in a situation in life where we are needing a comeback. Something has brought us down, something has brought us low, and we're needing to hear these words, to just need to pick yourself up, dust yourself down, And we go again. My own particular comeback story, some of you know, back in February I did a rather smart thing. I took my child out to play football during a hurricane and I slipped a disc. I didn't know it was a slipped disc at the time, but I spent quite some time in quite a bit of pain. Prior to that, I'd been the fittest I've ever been in my life. I've been on this bit of a journey. It started off in my mid-30s that I was going to be fit for 40 and so I made, I made the transition from being a, a junk food eating slob to being a junk food eating fit person. And so I made, I made that transition. And so I got to a point where, you know, it's hard, isn't it, to get off your sofa and go out for a run, to put on your running shoes. But I got to a point where actually I could get up at almost any point and go for a run. And I was doing what I thought were fairly significant distances. Like I could do 5 or 10k, fine, no problem. I could do 10 miles at at a stretch, a marathon. That's for the crazy people. But fair play to them. But this was the position I was in and I was doing a lot of fitness stuff. And then I slipped to this. And that was it. Like, all, all fitness ceased. Like, it was a matter of just getting through. I was brought low. I was on the canvas. I was down and out. And I was wondering... Am I ever going to be able to run? Am I ever going to be able to do like a, a Sean T workout? You know, a bit of love, a bit of Sean T. Or was I ever going to do something like that again? I didn't know. I didn't know what the future might look like. I was living in this land of uncertainty and it was feeling like, man, maybe not. But as time goes on, you learn and discover things. And I heard once, Uh, a wise person say, in the terms of fitness, that if you can't exercise one part of your body because of injury, that doesn't prevent you from exercising other parts. So I used the time. I'm a postman. So having slipped disc meant I couldn't work. So I was off work. 
So I used the initial part of my time to exercise my brain and I got quite good at editing video. So, so some of you might have seen some of the stuff we put online. I edit that stuff and put it out online so that hopefully someone who's not within the room will be blessed by the word and be encouraged and be built up and edified. That's the hope. And so I got quite good at doing that during that time. And as you get a little bit fitter and stronger, I started exercising other parts of my body. I thought, well, do you know what? I can, do, I can do some weight stuff, light, not heavy, but I can do some weight stuff. So I started doing that. And then I started doing long walks. I could do long walks again without hobbling around on crutches. And so I built myself into that. And then I got myself where I was able to go back to work and actually be a postman again. So I've done that. And in the last few weeks since I've been back to work, I've been out on a couple of short runs. Just a couple of kilometres at a time. The first couple, man alive, never tried anything so hard, ever. Like, it felt almost impossible. I felt like, am I ever going to get a level of fitness back? But you go out and you keep trying and you keep doing it. And last week, I managed to do a 5k. Praise God. You know, I'm able to get back onto my fitness journey. I've started doing my Sean T workouts again, you know. We're getting back into the groove of things. But man, it's not been easy. From that place of just feeling like you're down and out and you've got no certainty about your future, what do you do? How do you respond to that? Now, some of you might have heard this rather famous story, the story of Rocky and how Rocky came about. Rocky Balboa, what a character. He always comes back, doesn't he? He always gets up off the canvas and, and beats the, the... Well, Dolph Lundgren in this place, in this instance. Like, I'm a child of the 80s. I grew up, like, lusting after Rocky films. My parents wouldn't let me watch them. So, but I wanted to, because all my friends were allowed to watch these things. Why couldn't I? Well, now I'm a grown-up, I can watch them. And so, and so love Rocky. But Rocky is based on Sylvester Stallone's story, which is based upon a guy called, I don't, know, I don't even know his name, Verba, Verbenik or something. Anyway, Herman Verbenik. Anyway, he was a boxer that fought Muhammad Ali and he had no chance against Ali. And Sylvester Stallone saw him in a fight and thought, this guy's got guts and he's giving it everything. He's, he's not winning this, but he's giving it his all. And he was a, a, a little, you know, almost unknown boxer. But Sylvester Stallone thought he'll write a story about this, so he did. It was his first proper screenplay that he tried to get made into a film. He'd been in a couple of like little low-budget films before. And he took his script to the producers. And the producers said, well, OK, it's an all right story. We'll offer you $360,000 and we'll get someone like Burt Reynolds to play the main character. Sylvester Stallone was like, no, That's, I'm not going to be down and out. There's bigger things for me. So he persevered and he kept trying. And he persevered and in time, and it took a while, he managed to get to a place where he got a million dollars for his script and the starring role. And the rest, as they say, is history. But it's pretty amazing, isn't it? Just a couple of stories of how in real life we can come from a place of not being where we want to be, being in that place of uncertainty, being in that place of, I know that there should be more for me. I mean, I should not be wondering about my, my fitness and my future. I could have turned around and said, oh God, where are you in this moment? God, why have you allowed this circumstance to befall me? But if we remain steadfast and faithful in him. He will see us through. And this is the story that I want to share with us today. Some of us might be in this situation right now. I don't know your specific situation for all of you. Some of you might feel like you are in a place of feeling just down and brought low. It might have been caused by others. People around you might have just beaten you down, spoken negative words over your life, made you feel less than human, made you feel worthless and you are in a mental space where I, I can't face the world because it's all too much 
We've recently done a message on mental health and so often this is how it can start off. Something can bring us down low and then we find ourselves in this spiral of negative thinking and being unable to find our way out of it. This might be a situation caused by just a set of circumstances in your life. Circumstantially, your business might have floundered, you might have lost your job, you might have had a relationship that's gone bad, you might have broken your car, you might have you know, had a, a big bill come your way and it's brought you down and you don't know how you're going to get out of it. Your bank account might not look great. You, you might be wondering how are we going to get through this energy crisis that's looming upon us. What am I going to do? All this might have been caused by our own sin in our lives. We might have made some really heinous decisions that have meant that we're in this place of just being low and fighting through. You might have things in your life that you keep going back to and keep going back to and you know it's not good for you. You know that it's, it's not where you should be. Some habitual sin that you just, I can't break it. I can't get out of it. God, where are you in this? But through it all, I just want to encourage you and say that God is for you. He is on your side. And he can and will bring us through if we stay faithful, if we remain in his grace and his loving providence. We're going to run through a Bible in the story. A Bible in the story. Hold on a minute. Did anyone else catch that or was it just me? Hey, shocking. Who gave this guy a microphone? We're going to go through a Bible in the story, right? And it's the, uh, it's the story of David. David is, is a man that knew setback in his life, right? He went through setback after setback after setback. He, if anyone in the Bible could have given up on life, it could have been David. Like, he went through some stuff. And this story in particular we're going to talk about it's a bit later on in his life. You know, he's been king for a while. He's, he's been the mighty warrior. He's, he's been the man, you know. The, the nation loves him. They're like, oh, King David, you're so amazing. Hey! You know, and uh, this situation befalls him from his own family. From his own family. And what happens is, David has these, children that have ambition. These children have got some ambition and one in particular, a guy called Absalom, he has the greatest ambition of them all. He thinks that he should be king. And so, King David is in this situation in in 2 Samuel 15, 13 to 14, a messenger came and told David, the hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. And David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, come, we must flee or none of us will escape from Absalom. He's such a bad man that, you know what, I fear for my life. I've got to leave everything that I've ever known and get out of this situation right now. I I have to put my life on hold because the circumstance right now is so bad I can't see me getting out of this alive. We must leave immediately or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. Absalom's a bad man. He's coming against his father. These circumstances are not easy to deal with. But he's still being faithful in this situation, David. The story tells us that Ittai the Gittite, who is a foreigner in the in the court of David. Wanted to remain with David. He wanted to flee with David because, do you know what, he saw something in David that he wanted to be a part of. And David says, look, this isn't your battle. You don't have to fight this. You can go and do your own thing. And Ittai the Gittite says, do you know what, I'm with you. I'm with you the whole way. doesn't matter what the circumstances are. doesn't matter what you're facing. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and do it with you. I'm on your side. And David's like, God bless you. Come on then. Let's go. So David, with his small band, with his small army of not very many, against a nation now that has gone and sided with Absalom. Why have they sided with Absalom? Maybe he's a charismatic leader. Maybe he's got the resources. Maybe, I don't know, he's just got the right patter. But they sided with him. And so many people in the country wept over this situation, the writer of 2 Samuel tells us. And in 15, verse 25, the king said to Zadok, who was the priest, take the ark of God back into the city because the ark of the covenant where God's presence lived had been taken away with the king, with the rightful king. And David says, if I find favour in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see and his dwelling place again because David remains faithful in God's word. He's remaining faithful in the promises of God that God had placed him in a position. And David's saying, do you know what? The circumstances aren't looking great. If God is with me, he will bring me back. He will bring me back to this place to see the promise again. And in 15 verses 30 to 32, he says that David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went because of this situation. And his head was covered and he was barefoot All the people with him covered their heads too and were weeping as they went up. And now David had been told that Ahithophel, I think that's how you say it, you've got to say it fast and confident, haven't you? Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. So David prayed, Lord, turn Ahithophel's counsel into foolishness. See, because David, again, he's remaining faithful with God, knowing that God is on his side. The conspirators coming against him, those that had banded against David, those that might be bringing you low, those that might be bringing negativity into your world, those that might be bashing you down and causing you to be on the canvas, on the floor, all those people, you can, you can pray against that stuff. We don't have to entertain the negativity around us. We can take captive our thoughts and say, Do you know what, with God's help, with God on my side, I'm going to partner with God, I'm going to pray, I'm going to cry out to God and God can turn this situation into something better if he desires. But I will remain faithful and true to my maker. And so the story goes on. And in chapter 16, I'm whistling through this really quick. I'm trying to be quick because it's hot, isn't it? I get it. And we've got a baptism It's going to be awesome. Anyway, in chapter 16, verses 1 to 2, David had gone a short distance beyond the summit there was Ziba, the steward of Mephishabish, waiting to meet him. He had a string of donkeys saddled and loaded with 200 loaves of bread, 100 cakes of raisins, 100 cakes of figs and a skin of oil or wine. The king asked Ziba, why have you brought these? And Ziba answered, the donkeys are for the king's household to ride on. The bread and fruit are for the men to eat and the wine is to refresh those who become exhausted in the wilderness. Because God provides encouragement through the storm, right? Even when you're feeling like, man, this sucks. I don't know how I got here. Or maybe you do know how you got here. But even in the midst of it, God can provide an encouragement, a source of refreshment. If we remain in him, he can bring along the things that you need to sustain you. When we're in the middle of a a bad situation, his word can be the nourishment that we need to get through, can't it? When we find ourselves in a bad situation, a person who is of, of the family of God can come along with an encouragement and say, come on, let's do this together. We can get through this. We are together in this situation. So David and his men get refreshed. And the story goes on and it it tells us a little bit more. In chapter 18, verse 5, it's a long story in the Bible. It's a good couple of chapters. Sometimes these are the best stories though, aren't they? So they give you detail. 
They give you the, the nuance. And people that say, oh, I don't know if I believe the Bible, or I don't know if I want to go along with all this stuff, there's so much detail in here that the original readers would have read and gone, huh, I'll go and check that out for myself. Thank you very much. I'll get on Wikipedia. I'll go and find out where Ittai the Gittite lives and go and talk to him. I'm going to go to the mountain that he's, he's hiding in the caves. I'll go and see what that's all about. Because that's what they would have done. If anyone doubted the narratives, people could just very easily go and fact check it if they so desired. Anyway, in chapter 18, verse 5, the king commanded Joab, Abishai and Ittai, the Gittite. And this, for the context, is that David's got his little band of warriors and they're going to go against Absalom. They're going to go against Absalom and his army. They're going to fight it out to see who is going to be the king, who is going to be victorious. Because in that day, politics wasn't like politics that we know today. There was no democracy. If you were stronger, you won. So David and his army are going against Absalom. And king commanded, David commands his generals, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. He's still my son. I don't want you to, I don't want you to bring him down to his very end. I, I just want to I just want to win, but I don't want to humiliate him. I don't want to see him dead. He's still my son. I still care for him. And sometimes people can come against us. People that we know, people that we love. People can speak negativity into our world. People can do things that hurt us. But our heart, as Jesus teaches us, should be to pray for our enemies. Even those that mean us harm, God can turn a situation around for good. We don't know why we're in the circumstance we're in, often. We don't understand it. We don't know how we're going to get up off the canvas. But God is saying, keep your heart right through it. In verse 9, what happens is an unfortunate circumstance. But Absalom happened to meet David's men. And he was riding his mule. And as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree and he was left hanging in mid-air. Or a mule kept going. Absalom died there, not at anybody's hand. Man, where did you find that picture, John? That's phenomenal. But, he, yeah. But, do you know what? He died of, of no one's hand. But sometimes, as Ian shared a couple of weeks ago in his message on depression, that so often the devil will overplay his hand. Those that come against you might overplay their hand. People that are trying to bring you down, that are knocking you onto the canvas, onto the floor, to see you in a situation where you're losing in life, to see you in a situation where you've got nothing, you've fleed and you've left everything that you've ever known behind you. You might not have any money left, you might not even have any hope left, you might not have any life left. But God can bring about a circumstance where those bringing you down will leave you alone. They'll be gone. They'll be taken out of the equation. Now, we're not asking that anybody be died that's against you. That's not the point of this story. But God can turn around something. He can make a bad situation into a good one. He can take people from your life that are bringing you low and take them out of the equation completely. Sometimes it just requires blocking them on Facebook. Sometimes it requires something so much more than that. But God can bring about these situations. And the Bible is full of these little stories of how people have been knocked down, brought low and got up. You've just got to take the story of Job. The story of Job ends with him being in a greater situation than he started off with. Now, God didn't bring about the situation, but he did allow it. Now, 
Job ended up in a better place, personally. And we've just got to trust that all the characters in the story also ended up in a better place because maybe they had faith and trust in God. So we leave that into the hands and the care of our Heavenly Father who deals with things that we don't quite understand, right? And so the story of Job is like that. Sometimes the defeat ends with a greater reward. Joseph's story is a story where his brothers had it in for him, put him into a pit, wanted him out, and he ends up second in command of all of Egypt. Right? He ended up with great responsibility. And Jesus, ultimately, is the greatest comeback story, isn't he? The political leaders and the religious zealots wanted him out of the picture. He was upsetting the apple cart. He was damaging the status quo. He was getting the people on board with this not new idea, but it was an ancient idea. But an ancient idea that had been religiousized. This ancient idea of partnering with God to bring about his justice and his righteousness into all the earth. That we thought we have to stick by these certain set of rules and tick all these boxes. And Jesus says, no, 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 don't worry about these tick boxes. Just, just love your Father with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Love your neighbour as you love yourself. And Jesus is like, well, this is radical, isn't it? And everybody wants him gone. And they conspire against him. And he goes to the cross for us. He leaves everything that he knew. And he leaves it in the care of his father as he goes to that cross for us to experience his loving kindness, his graciousness, his compassion, his mercy, for taking upon himself what we should bear for ourselves so that we can live this eternal life with our Heavenly Father. It's such an awesome comeback when he raised from the dead on the third day. Man alive! And this is what our faith hinges on, isn't it? We have all these awesome stories that help us with life, that help us to get through the tough times. But ultimately, our faith hinges on a man and an event in history. This man, Jesus, he went to the grave. As we're going to see with Ian and his baptism a bit later on, he is burying his old man. He went to the grave. And Jesus came alive in a resurrected new body. This is what baptism symbolises. A new life. So I want to encourage you. The devil thinks that he can win against us. The devil thinks that he can, he can bring us down and low. And he might use people. He might use your circumstances. He might use your own poor decisions and your own rebellion against God to bring you to this place where you are flat out on the canvas, don't know what to do. But David has such an awesome song in 2 Samuel 22. He sings this to the Lord. The words of this song delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom shall I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge and my saviour. From violent people you save me. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and have been saved from my enemies. And we'll skip down to verse 17. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. However you're feeling today, God delights in you. Whether you are feeling like you're brought low and you're on the canvas, 
God delights in you. He will rescue you from your enemy. He will bring you out. He will give you a second chance to get up and to fight again. He'll give you a third chance to get up, to fight again. A fourth, a fifth. John 15, verse 4, Jesus says, Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now, Jesus is saying, stay in him. Stay in his sheepfold. Stay in his loving embrace. Stay under the sound of his voice. Stay in step with his spirit. Remain in him. Because in Romans 8.28, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We remain with Jesus. We stay within church. We stay within the word. We stay within the loving family that we're a part of. We stay within God's plan and purposes for our lives. We can get beat down. We can get smashed to pieces. We might be like that piece of pottery that Ezekiel, I think, or Jeremiah, one of the prophets, talks about and get smashed to the ground. But God can reform us. He can reshape us. He can bring us back out of the ashes. He can make us into a vessel worthy of honour and dignity once again because he delights in you. So pick yourself up. Dust yourself down. We can go again. And we've been through some stuff as a church. We've been through some stuff individually. But together, we will remain. Together, we will fight through. Together, we will see a victory. Together, we will see his purposes come into play. Together, we will see people come to the knowledge and understanding and revelation of who Jesus is. Together, we will see baptisms. Together, we will see new life. Together, we will be his ecclesia, his gathering, his church, and we will see great things. We might not be many in number, but God is with us. We are mighty, we have power, and we're going to see this town turned upside down for the glory of his name. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, I'm so thankful and grateful to be a part of your family. I'm so thankful and grateful to be in you. Father, I've been brought low. I've been on that canvas. I've lived with uncertainty about my future. I've lived with people speaking negative things against me. I've lived with people doing things to deliberately try and harm me. But Lord, you turn all things for good. You've made me stronger through it all. You've given me a greater hope through it all. You've given me a testimony to tell that when I'm down, I can trust in the Lord my God, my refuge, my shield, my shelter. You are my strong place. You are my joy and my strength. And I pray, God, that for each and every one of us here today, we can declare the same, that you are our shield, you are our refuge, and that your purposes and plans will prevail in our lives, however the circumstances may appear to be. So we bless your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.